tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's being called a miracle on a mountain. I mean, it is a total miracle that she is alive. The incredible rescue of a snowshoer buried by an avalanche on Mount Seymour. Plus, promising news from the Premier. We will be building a brand new acute care tower right here at Surrey Memorial Hospital. But the big question is when it will open with BC's healthcare crisis not budging. Also, an impossibly tight squeeze. We were shocked, so it's impossible to, to park. A new Vancouver townhouse complex with two small parking spaces, the advice and the warning to homeowners. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Tanya Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. Rescuers on the North Shore say it is a miracle she is still alive. A woman buried by an avalanche stuck upside down for 20 minutes under the snow. The CBC's Georgie Smythe has more on the incredible story and details of another avalanche that took a man's life in Alberta. In Alberta's Rocky Mountains, two men were hit by an avalanche while backcountry skiing on Sunday. Only one was able to dig himself out. The body of a 19-year-old man from BC has now been recovered. Makes us uh, think about things and certainly have a, a higher respect for the outdoor and what the environment can do for you and to you. On the same day, rescuer Jim Laurie expected the worst when a distress call came in from a man looking for his wife after an avalanche in the North Shore Mountains. Any avalanche call is quite serious. We fully expected by the time we got there that it was going to be a totally different outcome and we'd be looking for a, a body. The pair was snowshoeing when a slope gave way. The man eventually spotted the tip of his wife's snowshoe. When the husband dug his wife out, she was initially unconscious and quite blue because she wasn't getting uh, enough oxygen, but she was breathing, fortunately, and, and a long time had passed. It had been easily probably 20 minutes, possibly more, that she was buried in the snow. It is a total miracle that she is alive. When rescuers arrived, they first warmed the woman up and then brought her down the mountain. She's recovering at home. In BC's mountains, the risk of avalanches is high, especially on the coast. It's largely been driven by large amounts of snowfall. Most areas had over a metre of snow on the weekend, causing dangerous conditions. And we're expecting another big snowfall on Monday night. He says people should stay out of the backcountry until conditions improve. All that snow comes after months of hardly any, so the temptation to get in the mountains is high in spite of the dangers. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. And there was yet another fatality in BC's mountains over the weekend. A Vancouver woman has died after some sort of incident on Whistler's Blackcomb Mountain. Vail Resorts confirms the woman became separated from her partner who called Ski Patrol. Rescuers then found the woman unresponsive on an advanced ski trail near Catskinner Express chairlift. She was 32 years old. RCMP are clarifying there is no evidence to suggest a widespread diversion of safer supply drugs into the illegal market. This comes after Alberta Premier Danielle Smith and federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev used a recent drug seizure in Prince George to criticize BC's safer supply program. Last week, Prince George Mounties announced they had seized pills, including morphine and hydromorphone, that are part of a provincial program offering prescription alternatives to people at risk of overdosing. Now, RCMP say confirmed safer supply prescriptions do make up only a minority in drug seizures. Premier David Eby says if there is a systemic issue of those drugs being funneled, the province will take steps to address it. Um, there are a number of suggestions uh, uh, that have been put forward, some more practical than others, about, uh, about addressing the issue. But uh, really for us, it's about identifying uh, where any diversion may be taking place, uh, that we find the source and, uh, and address it quickly. Meanwhile, BC's Solicitor General says Premier Smith and Pierre Polyev should have waited for more details before making such claims about the province's program. Quite the sight around False Creek this morning with a fire sparking up outside Science World. Vancouver firefighters say the flames started deep in the piling supporting the decking on the dock. The fire was triggered by some sort of electrical issue stemming from work being done on the building. The specific location of this blaze made it particularly challenging for crews to access. We don't train specifically for fighting a fire under a pier that's just, you know, six feet from the water. Um, 
So adapt and overcome, our crews are really, really good at, at doing that. Investigators and electricians stayed on the scene for several hours to make sure the problem was contained. An unbelievably tight squeeze. That's what a Vancouver man and his neighbours are calling the parking spaces at their new housing complex. Our Benny Breach got a first-hand look at their frustrations and has more on what residents can do to avoid a similar situation. I can't get out. You can't get out? Oh, oh my gosh. This tight parking situation is not what Hussein Loy be expected when he finally came to see his brand new townhouse in Vancouver. We were shocked. So it's impossible to, to park. He purchased the townhouse as a pre-sale three years ago and says it's extremely difficult for either of his cars to fit the small car parking spot. We are really disappointed. Like I feel that um, the unit is without a parking spot. And did you know that this type of parking would be here? No, no, no emails came from the company at all. Uh, just came, this is your parking spot, 21. They, uh, they said they can't do anything about it. The developer Open Forum property says all parking stalls comply with relevant City of Vancouver standards and that the parking lot was approved by the city. Don't want to scratch it. We did bring Hussein's concerns to the City of Vancouver. It sent an inspector to the lot to measure the spaces, who also found the stalls do comply with city parking requirements. The city says a small parking space in Vancouver should be at least 2.3 meters wide. If there's a column, it can't encroach into the parking spot any more than 15 centimeters. Hussein is still left questioning his situation. That's the, uh, we, we are frustrated. We, people paid lots of money for this. Uh, that doesn't suit what we have a plan, what we have like uh, did for this unit. So yeah, we feel like as if we, are, we were cheated in a way. The city says in January, an inspector did go to the site and deemed it compliant, and that typically no measurements are taken unless there's a significant difference noted in person. One real estate lawyer says it's important for anyone purchasing a presale to pay careful attention to contracts, even when it comes to parking. So the problem with the presale is you don't see what you're buying when you sign the contract. You, you see there's a section on parking stalls, which usually says the developer gets to pick the parking stall and it could be any kind of parking stall anywhere. He said it's also a good idea to have a lawyer review the clauses before signing any contracts. Well, regarding parking stalls, I tell the client to re revise the offer and say I want a full-size, unobstructed parking stall. He says it's important to be proactive so you can get what you're paying for. And parking stalls are very expensive. Some parking stalls downtown can run you fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000. So it's not a small detail. Meanwhile, Hussein and his parking stall neighbors are still left feeling frustrated, hoping for another solution soon. Benit Braich, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, to the island in Victoria's mayor is calling on the province to delay its short-term rental rules set to take effect in May. The restrictions would ban most short-term rentals like Airbnbs that are not a person's primary residence. The city wants the rules postponed for the upcoming tourist season. The delay uh, is just for implementation and not for the legislation itself in any sense of changing it, but to delay its application uh, so that folks who are uh, holding STRs that are intended to be for the visitor industry uh, could have one last final high season, as we call it, in the summer. The mayor wants the short-term rental rules to come into effect in November this year instead. She'll be bringing a motion to council this week to request the province do just that. Federal Finance Minister Christian Freeland met with Premier David Eby today, weeks before she tables her budget next month. It's really great uh, to see you, Premier. Um, I was very happy about the BC Builds announcement when we tabled the fall economic statement. That was one of the things we had in mind that it was going to allow us to do. Freeland says inflation fell to 2.9 percent in January, down from 3.4 percent the month before. She says this is a return to the Bank of Canada's target range. Freeland adds wage growth in Canada has outpaced inflation for the past 12 months. She'll pre present this year's federal budget on April 16th. Well, the Premier unveiled details, meanwhile, of a new acute care tower for Story Memorial Hospital today. Physicians at that hospital say it's a step in the right direction, given the acute overcrowding and long wait times. But as John Hernandez reports, there are pressing concerns over when that new facility will actually open its doors. We will be building a brand new acute care tower right here at Surrey Memorial Hospital. Yeah. 
The Premier's words were what health care workers at Surrey Memorial Hospital had been waiting to hear for years. It's a massive move in the right direction. The busiest hospital in BC will soon be getting a major upgrade. This tower at the hospital will ensure that the residents of Surrey get top quality maternity care. They will get top quality specialty care. The announcement comes as more and more people continue to move into BC's fastest growing city. Investments in the region's health care have lagged, leading to what many health care workers have called a crisis inside the overcrowded hospital. We are seeing massive volumes, uh, high volumes of admission rates. We have uh, over, you know, on any given day, 100 patients uh, that are getting hallway medicine in the emergency department. Randeep uh, Gill is among doctors who have campaigned for a new tower at the hospital, which currently doesn't have the resources to treat the three leading causes of death heart attack, stroke, and trauma. We'll be pushing for those services. Uh, we'll be recruiting those specialists to come work here at the hospital. But those services are still a long way off. The province will spend at least a year developing a business plan for the tower. There is no set project completion date. The concern would be timeline uh, because we, we are in a dire need at the moment. Concerns shared by the site's medical director. We will still have long waits in our emergency department and we still will have hallway beds for a while. I want to assure you that nobody in this hospital wishes to provide that kind of care. The new tower, part of a bigger plan to fix the region's ailing health care services, with a new hospital and medical school also on the way. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. A group of BC medical students say they're questioning their future in the health care sector. They've written a report including recommendations to try to help alleviate their concerns and the province's ER crisis. As Callie McTavish reports, the Premier and the Health Minister say they are listening. Preet Gandhi is a third-year UBC medical student. He's co-authored the new report called Enough Waiting. It pinpoints problems in the province's emergency departments. I think as a medical student, it's very interesting to witness how the emergency department works and um, uh, how chaotic it can really be, where physicians who are trained to uh, manage this type of care are now saying that it is too chaotic and, and congested and unsafe. Um, that it means that it's time for action now. The group's recommendations include incentives for family doctors to offer more appointments outside regular daytime hours and adding more urgent primary care centres. BC's Premier and Health Minister met with the medical students behind the report. Our uh, health care system is under incredible strain. They believe, and uh, I think there's good reason to believe it, uh, that if people had access to family physician-like services outside of regular business hours, they'd be less likely to attend emergency rooms and as a result, uh, they would reduce congestion. Health Minister Adrian Dix says the province is already taking many of the steps they are suggesting. We made changes working with doctors, including young doctors, resident doctors, and new, do new to practice doctors. The result is a five-fold increase in new to practice doctors in longitudinal family practice, meaning family doctors taking patients, um, 708 net new doctors in the first nine months of our, uh, of our agreement uh, with family doctors. But the students say the overall concern remains and they're worried about what a future in medicine will look like. I think some of the concerns that we have about that is just whether that is a, if the ability to be able to do that into the future is going to be a little bit hampered by how stressful the healthcare system could be. The Premier says would-be medical students should not be discouraged, adding the province is taking their fears seriously. Callie McTavish, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the first cruise ship of the season has sailed into Canada Place. The ship, called the Disney Wonder, arrived this morning. The Port of Vancouver says this is the kickoff to what could be another record year for cruise passenger visits. This year we're anticipating more people. Um, the number of vessels hasn't exceeded last year, but uh, at 329, but we are expecting 1.27 passengers. Some of the ships are a little bit larger, which take a few more people. So that's how, that's how the, the math works out. This year's predicted 1.27 million passengers to Vancouver would be about a 2% increase from last year's all-time record. 
Well, Muslims are ringing in the start of the holy month of Ramadan across the world. It's a time when many will forego food and water to prioritize reflection, charity, and prayer. Our Zara Premji is hearing some of the hopes and goals many are tying to this special month. The holy month has arrived, and from Nayagamal, that means stocking up on tasty treats. I don't cook a lot, but usually for Ramadan, maybe this is the only time I really care about cooking. And she's not the only one shopping for fun ingredients for iftar, the meal eaten at sunset to break fast. <laughs> With festive foods just flying off the shelves at local grocery stores. Regular day, if not Ramadan, you know, like let's say 60% Ramadan, 200 percent up, double business for us, double work, you know what I mean? But Ramadan brings with it more than just food at the end of each day of fasting. There's an indescribable joy. I'm so excited. The best month in my life. I'm so excited. It's really an exciting time to, to spend time with family and to spend time with our community. This is a blessing month and we will pray to God to have mercy on us. It's not about being hungry all day, just giving, helping, praying, um, everything. And on the side of giving. Here in BC, what we've actually done is we're partnering with uh, interfaith partners and we're doing a food drive to raise food and funds for our local food banks. And it marks a fresh start for many who have set new goals. Uh, charge my battery. Yeah, not just uh, my religion battery, but also my spirit. Uh, family time, it's the best time for us to our family to get together because this is maybe the only months where we have a schedule, a very fixed schedule about breaking fasting. So my goal for this month is, is to learn more about my own faith and to really um, give back to my community and to participate in this Ramadan food drive uh, and really look at how I can make a difference in my community. For example, I don't talk to my sister, but in Ramadan, <laughs> again, you know, like open, open mind, open, you know, like, I mean, heart, you know. The sighting of a new moon will mark the end of the month of Ramadan and celebrations for Eid al-Fitr will take place. People will gather with friends and family to break bread and have a meal. Also come together at mosques, masjids, Ismaili Jamaat Khanas to celebrate the end of the holy month. Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Kareem. Happy Ramadan. Zara Premji, CBC News, Burnaby. And our Darius Madavi joins us now. And Darius, Ramadan begins when that crescent moon is sighted, marking the beginning of the month. And some Muslims are waiting until tomorrow to begin fasting because the crescent wasn't sighted everywhere in the world. So why does this happen? It's a great question, and it is uh, a little bit interesting because there are different schools of thought about when Ramadan should start. Now, uh, some people say that uh, it really matters about, the, even comes down to the weather, whether it's cloudy. Uh, cloudy skies could mean that you wait until the sky is clear. Uh, others say that it only matters when some people in the area are able to see it, so the weather isn't as big a problem. But as we saw just this year, uh, you can see yesterday, or you know, last night, uh, actually, some places, including just off the west coast of B had the possibility of seeing the crescent moon uh, even before anywhere else in the world. But today, or tonight, uh, most places around the world were expected to be able to see that crescent moon. This red area here means places that you should have been able to see it with the naked eye. But not everywhere actually did. Places like uh, Indonesia and uh, Oman, uh, they saw they didn't see that, full, uh, that crescent moon, and so they decided to wait until tomorrow. Other places like Saudi Arabia did. And the reason for that is that the crescent moon doesn't appear everywhere at the same time, because as that moon is coming around, uh, uh, it's in the way of the sun. It, the sun's light doesn't able to hit the moon and reflect back onto the Earth. But as it continues to move over, the Earth might have rotated. So some places, like uh, more eastern parts of the world, wouldn't have been able to see the moon, the crescent moon, even if it did show up that day. So uh, really a, a, an interesting start. And so that's why you might hear different start and end dates for Ramadan this year. Now, if we take a look at our weather here in BC, you may be able to spot the crescent moon tonight because it we might clear up a little bit on parts of the south coast. We've seen all that precipitation start to come in to parts of the coast, that snow at higher elevations, but for the most part, looking at rain. And over the next uh, 24 hours, 48 hours or so, we'll see some more of that precipitation come in, as well as some good snow for the mountains. So a little bit of uh, good news precipitation-wise until we get that sun later this week. You bet. Okay, we will talk to you again shortly. Thank you so much, Darius. Thanks, Tanya.
It is an exercise program for older men. Fit Fellas in West Vancouver aims to get men moving. But as Radio Canada's Monia Blanchette finds out, there's more to the program than just physical fitness. It's 7.40 on a Wednesday morning. A fitness class, unlike most, is starting up. The average age, 78. And the participants, men. Fit Fellas was created in the 1970s by Frank Carus. He was an avid runner who wanted to mix up his exercise routine. They didn't call it Fit Fellas at the time, but there was a core of these eight guys that gradually grew over the years. Barry Chapman has been teaching the Friday morning class for 28 years. Their program started small. Just 30 men participated back then. And it grew fairly quickly to... Uh, you know, up in the 60s and 70s. Now, around 170 men take part in eight different classes at the West Vancouver Community Center. Back to the first side. The exercises adapted for the age of the men participating. We concentrate on uh, strength, of course, but coordination and balance, which is so important as you get older to prevent falls and that sort of thing. Hold it there. Up on the second floor, it's a class for even older men. The exercises for those who are 90 years and up. I'm uh, 95 in uh, next, well, this week, yeah. I'm 101. I'll be 102 next month or something. This class is also tailored for those who have chronic illness or are recovering after an operation. But it's not just about exercise. The program also brings men together to socialize. The social part of our program is probably just as important as the, uh, as the fitness. I just tell the guy, we're here to have fun. If you get fit, that's your problem. You're going to have to deal with it. Monia Blanchet, CBC News, West Vancouver. Still ahead, much of the province is still seeing drought conditions even in the middle of March. After the break, we'll explore the critical impact on ranchers and fishers in particular and look ahead to what the warmer months might bring. Stay with us. And thank you for staying with us during our commercial free live stream to the East Coast. Now, where some people on Prince Edward Island are hoping to take advantage of that province's new rent to own program. They say they're frustrated. Almost 70 percent of those who've applied have been denied. And some that have been approved are still facing challenges getting into a home. The CBC's Steve Bruce has that story. Isaiah Henderson says he and his wife have worked hard to earn a decent income, to save up and to try to buy their own home. But in today's market, with high prices and interest rates, they're finding a mortgage approval is out of reach. Well, it's pretty frustrating to be, you know, shut down. It's like, okay, you know, here we are, we're 26, 27, trying to find our own home, trying to, you know, start a family. And we can't even do that with a one-bedroom apartment that we're in now. Now, though, some hope. Henderson and his wife were just pre-approved under the province's new rent-to-own program. Once they find the right place, government will buy it, they'll pay the mortgage, and in five years, they can buy the house. What they've paid already will go towards the purchase. But here's the challenge. The Hendersons were approved for a $300,000 home, but finding a place at that price, especially around Charlottetown, is tough. So happy that we got approved. Um, but now that we are approved, kind of looking at what we got approved for and the houses that are available, and it's kind of like another slap in the face. The fact they were pre-approved at all actually puts them in the minority. So far, the province has processed 107 applications for the rent-to-own program. 73 were declined, just 34 were pre-approved or conditionally pre-approved. I really didn't see any reason why I wouldn't be approved. But Amanda Mahar was declined. She's frustrated, she says, because she thought she met all the criteria and can more than afford the mortgage on the house she wants to buy. My credit cards are all paid up. You know, my score is well above where it needs to be. Maybe they weren't clear enough with their criteria. Realtor Arian Siegel says he is hearing similar frustrations. A lot of factors are coming in. I feel like the program needs to sort of lessen the strictness. It's the, the niche that it's targeting is very different than what it says that it's targeting. The rent-to-own program is 
The minister responsible for the program said today the qualifying criteria are standard and necessary. We want to make sure that people experience success in becoming a homeowner in the next five years. So we do have criteria that we've put in place uh, to make sure that people are successful. This is a pilot program. It'll wrap up at the end of November or once its budget of $17.5 million has been spent. The minister says the province will decide then whether to continue and if anything needs to change. Steve Bruce, CBC News, Charlottetown. While some parts of the province are seeing predictable winter weather, other regions are facing drought conditions in full force. In some areas, the drought has continued on since last summer. This week, we're going to discuss how drought is changing the way British Columbians live, work and source their food and power. Joining us now are two people in northern BC with a very vested interest in groundwater levels in particular. Darren Haskell is president of the Fraser Salmon Management Council and a member of the Slatson Nation. John Selecki is a cattle rancher near Burns Lake. Thank you both for joining us today. Now, uh, you, you, you both, you. thank you. You both live in areas that are currently under extreme, either extreme or exceptional drought conditions. What are your specific concerns as we head into the warmer months? John, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, specifically, we'd be concerned about forage growth, I suppose. You know, the amount of water that's in the ground, groundwater and, yeah, the runoff and all that, it's going to create problems for uh, the growth of our crops as well as uh, potentially watering cattle. And how about you, Darren? Um, we just water levels is just going to reduce that, the, the amount of physical fish habitat for, for our spawning salmon that are returning. Um, not only those, but the resident fish as well, you know, I mean, they need water to survive. And when these streams are, are drying out, you know, it, it's hard for them to even even survive through the winter. Like the, the eggs that are laid in, in the stream beds that can barely survive the winters without, without the water, groundwater flowing. So I think that's going to be huge coming up for the summer. Very real uh, concerns for both of you. Now, John, your operation depends on water to grow uh, grass for hay and to water your cattle. How did you manage to get through last year? And, and what is the long-term impact of drought on your production levels? Well, how we got through, well, last year really is this winter is, is really the thing. And, and we had a carryover hay from the year before. And uh, because we have an irrigation system, then we can you know have a little more production than we might need on a year-to-year -year basis but last year of course any of our ground that wasn't irrigated uh didn't produce anything so because of that then we had to use our carryover from from the previous year yeah so that would be our concern is just being able to provide feed as well as uh the forage levels out on the range you know once the cattle leave home here in the in, uh, beginning of, of june and uh, head out to range, uh, we need enough grass to support them once they get out there. So that's yeah. a concern. Sure. Yeah, no doubt. And Darren, we know that dwindling fish populations are bad for local eco ecosystems all around. What What is the impact on, on First Nations communities in particular? Uh, you know, um, many First Nations along the Fraser, not just us, but they, they depend on, you know, the salmon runs to every year for their, for their food for for a healthy diet, you know, and, uh, you know, with, with, the, with, with the cost of groceries these days, with the inflation rates, it's crazy. Um, more and more people would like to have salmon and, and you know, traditional foods. And uh, if we're not able to get that, you know, if we're, like we, we, have to, we have to depend on the grocery stores. I mean, our elders call our resources, like our, our natural resources, our, our grocery store. That's, that's, that's what we depend on for food. And if we're not able to, to, to access any of that, you know, it's just going to be a tough year of, you know, depending on, on the grocery stores in town and, uh, you know, we're not able to practice our culture of, you know, preparing the fish, drying it and storing it for the, 
for the winter months and uh uh like you said the, the stocks are already dwindling and then now we have to play with you know you know mother nature and climate change for to really get these stocks back back to the traditional levels so. Yeah, no doubt. Um, now, John, you obviously can't create more water. So what are you doing or what can you do to alleviate the harm? Well, what we're doing here at home is uh, in conjunction with Ducks Unlimited, we've got a, a water project development here. So we're digging, digging a series of dugouts uh, to store water. We're uh, also putting in something called a nose pump along one of the lakes that we have. Uh, this is uh, maybe more to conserve the the lake and the foreshore, you know, the riparian area around the lake, and, and there's a spring there that we, we'd like to keep the cattle out of that. So that's those are the things we've been doing. We've also put uh, a fence along Tatterose Lake, which is the one that's right in front of my house here, and we will put a fence, I should say. And that, we, you know, we're trying to improve the riparian areas on the ranch as well as provide for the cattle. Well, no doubt very uh, practical implications for both of you. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Darren Haskell is president of the Fraser Salmon Management Council. Well, coming up, still, it's a photo that seemed innocent enough. A Mother's Day picture of Princess Kate with her children, but then the revelation, it was altered. The questions it's raising and the conspiracy theories it's feeding coming up. In 53 years of competition, it had never happened before. A group of teams from a territory where hockey reigns supreme, capturing gold at the Arctic Winter Games. But last February in Fort McMurray, Alberta, they did it. Champions of the circumpolar world. A monumental win, where even in minus 30 weather, the communities rallied to welcome their champions. Players returned home to parades and celebrations in their communities. We're on a chuck. We're, there's lots of guys. <laughs> now the team is gearing up for yet another run, looking to accomplish what seemed impossible only 11 months ago. Guys won gold last year, so that's our slogan. All right, so you guys got to remember what that is. Prepared to defend, ready to repeat. Led this year by head coach Martin Joy, the team is heading into Alaska with an identity. We can compete now. We're not going there just to learn or feel ourselves out. So everybody loves a good story up here. Everybody loves to get behind the athletes. And that's why it's so important. This year presents a taller task with the team more spread out than they were last year. Three of the returning players won't meet up with their new teammates until weeks before the tournament, staying sharp while playing hockey away from home in Manitoba. Wiseman, a score! Some players like Rankin Inlet's Gregory Wiseman take their talent south to develop on and off the ice. Hockey is both their solace and their ticket. It's our like way of getting away from everything. Just a way to escape from reality, I guess. Like in Jordan Tutu's book, some of the stuff that happens in Rankin or in Nineveh, it's just a way to get, a, get away from that. Some people take for granted like how much like athletics and how much achieving goals, like especially at like you could call it an international competition going there. And I think that's stuff that, well, you know, those players will remember it forever. The communities have so much pride in their players and with their homegrown talent. We always talk about lighting that spark for all the other kids. And now these kids here, they obviously watched the games last year. They, they're part of the excitement. And, uh, and that's really what about hockey does for these small communities. It just gives itself life, shows the kids that there's something to train for, something ahead of them and it, you know it just provides that uh, foundation that we're looking for. The Canadians will be facing some unfamiliar rule changes like how they won't be allowed to ice the puck while killing a penalty but after beating Alaska in the gold medal game last year the team is up to the challenge.
Welcome back. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met with his incident response group today to discuss the worsening situation in Haiti. Powerful gangs have seized control of much of the country's capital city in recent weeks. Thousands of Canadians are believed to be trapped in Haiti. The CBC's Evan Dyer has the latest. Haiti's outnumbered police are fighting a losing battle for territory. The city of Port-au-Prince is surrounded by gang territory, and more than 80 percent of the city itself is under gang control. Only the middle-class area of Petionville remains under police control. Both the airport and the seaport are now in gang territory. Haiti's capital is effectively besieged. There are quarters where it's definitely a no-go area. Uh, and more than probably there are wounded people who cannot reach anymore our uh, hospital. Our main fear is about the supply. So as there are the port, as the airport are closed, it's impossible to bring in some medicines, and that's our worry. U.S., Canadian and Caribbean officials met in Jamaica to discuss standing up a new Haitian government and sending foreign police and troops. But Haitian factions remain far apart. We have impressed upon on the respective parties that time is not on their side. The Caribbean community was hoping for just one proposal from Haiti's political and civic leaders, but instead they got at least four and maybe as many as seven. And at the same time, we're trying to address the reality that exists today on the streets. What do you do about the gangs? I mean, do you bring them in or do you make them part of the equation? And, and the most important question is, will a political deal basically temper down this violence? The backbone of a proposed multinational force will be made up of police from Kenya. Canada is supporting that force with money and resources and training. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to restore order. The discussion today will be taking, will be really focusing on that question, but also on the question of the political transition that will allow an election to take place. But right now, um, is, is we couldn't have an election because there's too much insecurity and too much violence and going on in the communities. The situation in Haiti's capital is so far gone, it's not clear how any police force can retake the city. Even if the multinational force finally comes together, it would currently have only a maximum of about 3,000 police officers, about one-third the size of Haiti's own outnumbered force. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, flash floods and landslides have killed 26 people in Indonesia's Sumatra Island, with at least 11 others believed to be missing. <laughs> Monsoon rains and rising rivers have submerged several districts and cities in West Sumatra since Thursday. Relief efforts have been hampered by power outages and damaged bridges and roads blocked by thick mud and debris. More than 37,000 homes and buildings are said to be inundated. To the UK and Britain is used to seeing photos of the royal family by now, but one in particular from the weekend is in the spotlight today. It was an innocent enough picture of Kate and her children until people noticed it had been altered. As the CBC's Chris Brown explains, that's when the story changed entirely. On a day to celebrate the Commonwealth, the theme of the event was resilience of the 75-year-old institution and, it would seem, of Britain's royal family. With King Charles out undergoing cancer treatment, Queen Camilla led the royal delegation to Westminster Abbey. But it was the also absent and recuperating Catherine, Princess of Wales, and her Mother's Day photo that upstaged the main event. News agencies issued a dramatic-sounding kill order for the photo after eagle-eyed social media sleuths saw clues it had been digitally altered. Among them was that the sleeve of Princess Charlotte's arm had partially disappeared and a zipper on Catherine's sweater was misaligned. The Princess of Wales hasn't made any public appearances since abdominal surgery in January, and the internet was already in overdrive with rumours about how well she's recovering. This image was designed to sort of quash those rumours and to make everyone feel very reassured that she's fine and with her children and enjoying Mother's Day like many others. And of course, it just took a, a very, very different turn. The mystery of who altered the photo and why 
was answered by Catherine herself, tweeting, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion. Down with the crowd! Whether that put the issue to rest appeared to depend on what you thought about the monarchy in the first place. They say they want to be part of public and of being open and honest, but they're not open and honest. We're picking holes in everything, aren't they? You know, we can't we just get on with life. The King, meanwhile, sent video greetings to the Commonwealth ceremony. In recent weeks, I have been most deeply touched by your wonderfully kind and thoughtful good wishes for my health. After the apology, Catherine was glimpsed in a vehicle with William. Kensington Palace has indicated she'll return to duty after Easter, and this royal author expects only then will the speculation be put to rest. I think that's the moment where the press do decide, OK, is this more serious than we think, or are we back on track? Kensington Palace said the Mother's Day photograph was taken by Prince William last week, but they will not release the original which means it's impossible to assess what parts have been changed or enhanced. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Coming up, a big stage for a team from Haida Gwaii. We'll take you to a basketball game to remember on the way next. Well, here we are again, inside, because, you know, another beeping snowstorm. Hey, can we get that, like, sound effect, that, like, beep, you know? Okay. Another snowstorm. <sighs> well, before you get to the shoveling, I mean, what are you going to do? And what are you going to do it with? Eat. You could watch the news. Ugh, no. What to watch, what to watch. You could watch Son of a Critch on CBC Gem, a charmer of a show that captures the flavor of Newfoundland humor. That pairs well with roast chicken chips. Or Love is Blind, that reality show on Netflix that everybody is watching. I mean, have you seen the girl that looks like Megan Fox? Or at least she says she looks like Megan Fox. Anyways, that pairs lovely with something really cheesy. Hawkins Cheesies. Almost as cheesy as that show. Next up, some action, like Fast and Furious. I mean, watch them all. There's more than enough with the same actors, the same premise. I get it, stuff blows up. So if you're setting up your storm day for some stale plot lines, maybe reach into the back of your cupboard and see if that chip clip is still working. When did you get these? And if your big screen isn't cutting it, maybe take a look at your big picture, the window. Look outside, ponder, think about what's to come. What to pair with as you ponder how your back is gonna feel tomorrow. Sure, there's chips, but I'd go with something a little stronger. I mean, remember, it all melts. And when it does, we'll be back to tell you what to pair with mowing your lawn.
Our Darius Madavi is back with us now. And before we get to that forecast, Darius, let's talk seismology because it sounds like there's some pretty significant activity happening below. Yes, that's right. Uh, we saw a last week a seismic swarm is what they call it, which sounds a little bit scary, but uh, no need to worry. So this shows you the, uh, the network of ocean cables uh, all around Canada. And so we have many of them here off the coast, and they aren't just used for getting you high-speed fiber internet. They're also used for all sorts of scientific monitoring. And so, uh, if you take a look here, you can see one of these cables reaching out down the bottom, and we're focusing really on the Neptune Observatory, which uh, is, is uh, organized in part by the University of Victoria, and they research all sorts of seismic activity. So those fiber optic cables that bring you your high-speed internet, or if you're in a more remote area, you wish brought you your high-speed internet, uh, can also be used to find really sensitive uh, vibrations in the ocean floor. And that gives us a lot of really important information about what's happening underneath the ground beneath our feet. And so at this site, Endeavour, we see that sort of seismic activity roughly every 20 years. And so the last time we got seismic activity of this magnitude was in 2005. And when that happened, we saw this uh, seismic swarm. And what happens is called a magmatic intrusion or a uh, magmatic rupture. And that sounds also very scary. But what's happening is the tectonic plates are moving apart and, and magma comes up up from deep underneath in the core, uh, not in the core, but uh, deep underneath the surface, rushes up that 800 degrees Celsius magma meets the, uh, the very cold ocean water uh, deep, in the, uh, deep under the water, and that forms a new ocean crust underneath. So this is a natural process, and thanks to these cables, I know this graphic is a lot, but these white cables are the only important part, uh, these important, uh, these cables can measure that sort of seismic activity. So uh, very exciting stuff. This graphic also shows you where all that seismic activity has taken place in that rift uh, over, that, over that period where we got that really exciting stuff. So. So all of that to ask, is there any reason for us to be concerned? Fortunately, no. So when we looked at that map, that was 250 kilometers off the coast of Vancouver Island, very far away. We're talking at most magnitude four uh, earthquakes, and so not really much reason to be concerned in terms of the, uh, of the activity that we're seeing, but uh, a little bit interesting in terms of the science, not just in terms of the earthquakes, but these hydrothermal vents are full of all sorts of really uh, interesting creatures, all sorts of uh, interesting biodiversity. So that's really the main thing we're focusing on, all those chemicals. And so we're interested in how that might change in the wake of these earthquakes. So not really any reason to be worried, but lots of reasons to be interested in all the science that'll come out of it. Now, if you want to be worried about something, we can turn to the weather. We have one weather warning in place in BC, should come down by around midnight, but we are expecting some very strong winds on the coast of uh, around Victoria, the Victoria area, some strong winds in that strait as they, uh, they bend around. That's going to calm down in the next uh, few hours as that frontal system moves through. It's going to leave some unsettled conditions in its wake, which means we may see uh, after these winds calm down a little bit more precipitation into tomorrow, but then for the most part, drying up as we get later into the week. Now, if we zoom out to the province, we can see that precipitation as it rolls in. Plenty of snow for the mountains, primarily on the south coast in the next 24 hours, but within, uh, if we go a little bit further, you can see a little bit starting to build up on some of those more northern ranges as well. A little bit of activity happening in the southeast as well, but for the most part, starting to calm down. And as we get into the end of this week, we're talking just sun, very little cloud, no precipitation to speak of in the more southern parts of the province. That's Thursday, Friday, and heading into the weekend. If we take a look at our conditions for now, you might not expect that because it looks like there's still plenty happening uh, anywhere really except for the south coast. This is just a chance of activity uh, other than the island, which is getting hit pretty hard with that precipitation. And we've seen a decent dump in places like Whistler as well. Uh, for the most part, we are calming down. I'm also gonna show this map of the mountains, the local Vancouver mountains, because it might be the last time we get to look at it for a while and see that precipitation as we start to dry out. Looks like we're gonna be hitting a bit of a dry week starting this Thursday, because you can see here, we get those morning showers possible tomorrow. Should be drying up for just a mix of sun and cloud in the afternoon. We get a cloudy day Wednesday, clearing up overnight for a beautiful sunny Thursday. Those temperatures continue to climb into the weekend. <clears throat> and you'll notice I said warm, warmer and warmer -er. I was gonna say warmest, <laughs> but we're gonna warm up even more than that into Sunday and the end of, uh, beginning of next week. So couldn't say that. We will make that a new word, official one. Thank you so much, Darius. Thanks, Danielle.
LBC's high school basketball championships wrapped up in Langley over the weekend. The tournament drew dozens of teams from right across the province, all vying for that provincial title. And for the first time ever, a boys team from Haida Gwaii made it right to the final. As Janella Hamilton is finding out, the sport is so much more than just a competition to these players. For 17-year-old Levi Burton, playing basketball on a provincial stage is a dream come true. I don't even know how to describe the feeling. Like it's just something I've never, I've never felt before. Like just knowing that this is the furthest any team has ever made it. Like just knowing we've already made history. The coach of the Gidgalang Kuyas Neighbreaker says this is the first time ever a boys sports team from as far away as Haida Gwaii has made it to the championship finals. Representing Haida Gwaii is quite crucial to me. Burton, who is from Skidiget, says the island communities often host tournaments as a way to connect and socialize. It, it brings everyone from the small island of Haida Gwaii together, and it's just, it's just really beautiful like how we just connect as a family through the game. It's a long-time tradition for the close-knit community that dates back to the dark period of the residential school system. There's a, a long history of um, basketball on Haida Gwaii just through Skidiget Saints and through culture at the same time, right? It was brought back from residential school through residential school survivors because when they abolished potlatches, they created this tournament called the All Native, and and the All Native was uh, was a um, was a gathering point for for families and friends. He says basketball became one of the only ways for Indigenous people to gather during that time. 17-year-old Timo Laughlin's love for basketball came from his mother and father, who also competed in the sport, a passion passed down through generations. I think we're just showing that small schools can make it this far and, you know, representing all the little Indigenous schools around the province. A long history with people like Steve Nash playing in it, Kelly Olenek who's in the NBA right now. So it's something that they can aspire to as they go forward in their basketball careers. A lifetime experience under the bright lights, surrounded by cheering crowds. In the end, it was a heartbreaking three-point loss to Chilliwack's Unity Christian team. The breakers, visibly emotional, but in good spirits. I'm just so proud of my guys. Like, they're the reason we're here. I love each and every one of them. We played so hard. No one expected us to be this far except for ourselves. And I know everyone's proud of us. For now, the team is walking away with a silver medal, lifelong memories, and the drive to come back even stronger next year. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Langley. A BC wrestler has punched his ticket to the Paris Olympics after a dominating performance at the qualifiers in Mexico earlier this week. Our Saurabh Zandu caught up with the medal hopeful as he prepares now for the world stage. So it's all about timing. Sari's Amar Tesi is giving tips to aspiring wrestlers for the Khalsa Wrestling Club at the Newton Recreation Center. He's back in town from Mexico, fresh off his victory at the Pan Am Olympic qualifiers. And ever since, Tesi says he's been showered with congratulatory messages. I, I, don't, I couldn't even count. I think over 100 messages. And they're all from my family, loved ones, friends, people I don't know, right? This isn't his first Olympics. The 28-year-old made it to Tokyo Olympics and finished 13th. But since then, he's grabbed a gold medal at the Commonwealth and Pan Am Games. The experiences he's had going to the Japan Olympics is an experience that he can build upon. And going into Paris, he's going to definitely have a great opportunity to medal. Tacey began his wrestling career alongside his older brother. From babies, we've been wrestling with each other. We've been each other's training partners uh, pretty much our whole lives. Training under the guidance of their father, who himself was a national wrestling champion in India. He has a, a wrestling lineage in his father and a passion that way. And to continue in the sport, you definitely have to have that burning passion to, to go on beyond the high school and college level. While TC has gone on to compete at the highest level, his father and brother continue to train up-and-coming athletes. And Amar pitches in whenever he gets a chance. I think it motivates everybody that, hey, you know what, one day we can get to that level. The club here means everything to me. My dad started this up in 1976. We're here still going and we're going to keep it going. Besides training and coaching others, it's also a time for TC to catch up on some much-needed downtime. I love our Punjabi food here. When I get a haircut this morning, my barber was like, hey, you look so small. I was like, I have my mom's cooking. Tacey's not staying too long, though. 
He's headed back to Ohio where he's training for Paris and another chance to pin down an Olympic medal. Sohrab Sanu, CBC News, Surrey. Still ahead, we take you to a very special birthday party in Port Coquitlam, celebrating the matriarchy of a family who's now well into her hundreds. That's coming up after the break. We're here at the uh, Richmond Olympic Oval for the RBC Training Ground. And the RBC Training Ground is a platform where we can identify uh, youth athletes to help kickstart their Olympic dream. We're here and testing athletes with their, through their endurance, their power, agility, and their strength. And through those tests, we identify which sports those athletes are best suited for. And then we can partner them with the National Sports Organization. And through that pathway, they have an opportunity to then compete at the national level and hopefully at the international level with the major goal of being an Olympic athlete here for Canada. I just wanted to see um, what this was about and I thought it would be a really cool experience just to try out even if I didn't match up but yeah overall I think it was a really really good experience. It's a really great opportunity to try and test your ability to see how far you can go and become an Olympic athlete someday. We've got all these athletes from the ages of 14 to 24 that are going through a whole bunch of different tests to kind of test their speed, power, endurance, and there's a lot of different national sporting organizations here of we're going to look at the data and try and pull these athletes and say, hey, do you want to try out our sport? And if they do well at that, they could be the next Olympian that maybe is representing us in 2026, 2028, and onward. I think it's a great opportunity for these 14 to 24-year-olds to just kind of come out, see where you're at, talk with some of the different sports, and maybe you just haven't found the right sport for you yet, and you never know, that could be the one that takes you to the Olympics. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Benit Brach at the Alumni UBC webinar, Build the Future with Gen Z, April 3rd. A panel of Gen Z UBC students and alumni will share their views and experiences about their cohort's values and aspirations, approaches to work, and more. And never miss a special programming series, event, or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver inbox. Today is Lois Cairns' birthday, and it's a special one. She's turning 107 years old. Well, Lois has five children, 12 grandkids, and 19 great-grandkids. And the family came together in Port Coquitlam yesterday to celebrate, so we stopped by. She's certainly kept a lot of her uh, 
her personality well into her hundreds. The secret, well, she, <laughs> the other thing she has always done, she never drinks, um, but she would always ask for a glass of wine with a little bit in it so that nobody would think that she had a problem. <laughs> we always admired her for her, um, I guess her youthfulness. Like, she was golfing 18 holes in her 80s, like walking nine holes as she turned 100. She was still using her walker to just do some laps around the block and then laps around her, her home. Just a great day. Nice to, uh, there are five kids, there are 12 grandchildren and 19 great-grandchildren. So this is sort of half, half of the clan and we're, you know, it's wonderful to be with mom at this time. A very happy birthday to Lois. Thank you for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch this newscast on CBC Gem. That's our free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is at 11 o'clock, right after the National. Have a good night. Good night.